Hello and welcome to the Superposition Guys podcast. My name is Yuval, and my guests today are Rob Sholkov, co-founder and chief scientist at Quantum Circuits, Inc., and Ray Smith, CEO. Rob shares insights on Quantum Circuits' unique dual-rail qubit approach, which focuses on reducing error rates through error detection and correction at the hardware level. Ray emphasizes the company's shift from scientific research to commercial implementation, highlighting its cost efficiency and full-stack quantum computing solution. We discuss the scaling potential of superconducting qubits, the importance of error correction, the next steps for quantum circuits technology, and much more. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Hello, Rob. Hello, Ray. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Yuval. How are you doing? Hello. Living the dream. So, Rob, who are you and what do you do? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Rob Sholkoff. I'm the Sterling Professor of Applied Physics at Yale University, and I'm uh, the co-founder and chief scientist at Quantum Circuit Sync. And Ray, how about you? Who are you and what do you do? Uh, I'm the uh, CEO of a really impressive company called Quantum Circuits, Inc., and a partner with Rob, who is the founder of this company. And uh, I think we're making some very important progress in the world of quantum computing, and we're really happy to talk about it today. Why does the world need another quantum computing company? I mean, there seems to be so many. What's, what's new and different about your approach? Well, I think, uh, you know, the thesis behind me founding Quantum Circuits, Inc. is that, you know, uh, I really felt that the approach that everyone was taking was probably a little too cumbersome to really scale to, uh, you know, do useful problems and that, you know, we would need to have kind of a partnership between academic research and industrial development that was really focused on efficiently solving the problem of quantum error correction. Okay. So tell me how you got to this and, and what's, what is the innovation in your technology? Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, as part of the backstory, um, I mean, I started, uh, my lab at Yale in 1998, uh, before anybody had qubits, maybe trapped ions were already around, but uh, nobody had built a superconducting qubit. And it was actually kind of a curiosity-based uh, thing. We were asking the question, can you ever build a man-made macroscopic object like a circuit that's a millimeter on a side uh, and have it follow the true rules of uh, the quantum world with superposition, entanglement, and all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, there were a lot of innovations along the way. I mean, we founded this field of circuit quantum electrodynamics where you use microwave signals to control and measure and uh, connect uh, various qubits. And, you know, then around 2008 or 2009 uh, came the transmon, which made superconducting qubits really kind of stable. And, you know, we were able to do some of the first quantum algorithms just in the university lab. And, you know, we started to see the growth of the sort of the industrial efforts with IBM and Google and Rigetti and so on, all doing, you know, subtle variations on this basic platform of transmons and circuit QED. And how is your superconducting qubit different than IBM or Rigetti or IQM or all the other companies that are doing superconducting. Right. Well, I mean, we've sort of focused, uh, you know, since about 2010 or so on um, a kind of flipped paradigm in superconducting devices. So uh, we don't use the Josephson Junction based transmon qubits as the primary information carrier. Uh, we use, you know, true microwave photons in some kind of linear resonator. It can be an LC on a chip. Uh, it can be a three-dimensional cavity. And that offers a lot of advantages. These um, devices can have longer coherence times, and they also have a simpler error model. They have fewer types of errors and uh, errors which you can devise more efficient ways of detecting and correcting. Ray, I think you are uh, an accomplished business person. And so, and you've joined the company not too long ago. Does that signal that 
you're close to having a product uh, that's out of the lab and into users' hands? Yeah, it's a <clears throat> it's a great question, and it's a it's a uh, there's a reason why I'm here. Uh, when Rob talked about starting this back in 2008, I was thinking about where I was at the time, and I was working on security, IP, you know, wireless, uh, you know, wireless LAN mobility, and uh, and here I am and working in probably one of the most interesting science areas that is about to go commercial. Um, so I think the industry would agree we're kind of at that tipping point moving from the science world to the engineering world and ultimately to the commercial world associated with bringing quantum solutions to to the marketplace. So, um, so you know, this company has been working very diligently building the science around the inventions that Rob just talked about, the innovations around the dual rail qubit and the, uh, the approach. And this company has really from the very beginning been focused on correcting and then scaling. Um, that science has been proven to work. So now it's time to take it to the market. So that's when I had a chance to meet Rob about a year ago and talked about the vision and the, the potential of this business and uh, decided it was about the right time for someone such as myself. So yeah, I bring years and years of experience working in Silicon Valley and taking technology to the market and building customers and revenue. Um, and I think the uh, the time has come for us to do the same here at Quantum Circuits. So so that's why I'm here, is to kind of kind of bolt the superposition of you know science <laughs> and business together at the same time, and see if we can't make um, the world a better place with quantum computers. So you started in 1998. I think I heard yesterday that Chris Monroe had the first tra uh, trapped iron one two years prior, but. Sounds like an overnight revolution, 25 years in the making uh, for you. Um, give us some numbers. I mean, how, how, are you, how do you measure the technical success? How many qubits do you have? What's the single qubit gate fidelity? What's the two qubit gate fidelity? What's the uh, coherence time? Something that we can compare it to existing superconducting solutions. Yeah. So, um, you know, we were have been following this kind of, alternative approach and trying to really build devices that can uh, detect and correct the errors at kind of the hardware level because we don't want to have to massively scale to thousands of qubits, uh, physical qubits, to make one high performance qubit. And um, I guess a year or two ago, we really kind of had a breakthrough on this approach, which is this idea called the dual rail. And in the dual rail, you have uh, a qubit, which is the superposition of a single microwave excitation in one 3D cavity or in another 3D cavity. And it allows you to uh, basically detect when a photon is lost, which is the only dominant uh, source of error in this kind of system. And so the basic idea is that uh, you essentially, even if you're making something which is uh, at the physical level, you know, near the current state of the art where fidelities are 99% or something like that, uh, you basically get to have the first round of error correction built into the devices and kind of square that probability. So uh, as a sort of first instance, there's this metric called SPAM, state preparation and measurement, which uh, people don't talk about as much, but of course you got to initialize the computer and read it out. and uh, in the superconducting platforms, that's typically a few percent error per uh, per qubit, uh, which means you're kind of, even before you're doing gates, you're starting out at something which is not super high fidelity. So with these dual rail qubits, you get to detect errors in the preparation. You can prepare the state, you can check it, then use it, and then detect at the end and throw away or detect the shots that uh, have an actual error in them. And we were able to demonstrate spam at the 10 to the minus four level. So really like kind of 99% squared. And, you know, what we've been doing now at QCI is the first uh, versions of this uh, qubit scaled up into uh, the first small machine. So um, the things we're operating in the lab right now have a handful of these dual rail qubits um, with, uh, you know, gate fidelities that are pretty competitive 
uh, but also with kind of this error model, which allows you to then incorporate them into even small error correcting codes and get some gain. So what we're looking to do in the near future is build machines with, uh, say, a few dozen of these dual rail qubits. And then there's kind of two uses. One is it's a post NISC machine where you can operate it as some number of physical qubits and uh, detect the errors, but then still keep the shots that are good, meaning you have a much higher fidelity computation in the end. Uh, and you can use it to uh, implement error correcting codes on top of this uh, more robust version of a qubit. And we think you know the, the goal there is to have it so that as you increase the distance of a code or you add another layer of redundancy in the hardware, you don't gain like a factor of 1.5 or 2, you gain a factor of 10 or maybe even a factor of uh, 20 or 100. And then, you know, if you can scale that sort of a machine, maybe you only need a few hundred physical qubits to make one very high performance logical qubit. So when I listen to you describe this, uh, it reminds me a little bit of what people say about cat qubits, right? That there's you know, face flip errors and bit flip errors, and maybe they're kind of inherently immune to uh, one type and therefore need fewer physical qubits to create a logical qubit. Is that true? I mean, is the analogy correct? Yeah, the um, I mean, the cat qubits that a few people are working with are also things that were innovated, you know, by my collaborators uh, and I at Yale. Uh, and they often use the same technique uh, or always use the same technique of encoding the information in a cavity. Um, what the cat qubits are, uh, you know, and maybe also the cat qubit uh, uh, is the first device that actually performed error correction uh, in real time on the native errors and got gain. That was an experiment we did in my lab in 2016. The gain was like 1.2 or something. And more recently, gains have gotten up to about uh, two. Um, the cat qubit approach is a little bit of a more novel thing, trying to stabilize and get a nice error model. But this dual rail is kind of, you just build these cavities and you get the nice error properties kind of for free. And, you know, the other thing that's really hard with some of these devices like the CAD qubits is how do you actually perform gates and entangling operations, uh, you know, single and two qubit gates on them. It's a much more complicated manipulation than just working with two transmons. And a nice feature of the dual rail is it's like, um, you know, I, I sort of have been saying that the dual rail is to error correction as the transmon is to Josephson junction qubit. So like before the transmon, there were all these different varieties of superconducting qubits based on flux or charge or phase, and they all kind of had their strengths and their weaknesses. And the transmon was something that was like much simpler than any of those approaches. It was this head slap moment, like, why didn't we think of this earlier, uh, which sort of avoided all of the known problems and made something that was stable. And for me, the dual rail is like that same head slap moment, like, oh, here's the simple thing that takes this thesis of it's better to work with cavities than transmons uh, directly and uh, makes it simple and easy. So, you know, in uh, cat qubits, you can do gates, but they also have a few percent error, even for a single qubit gate uh, with the dual rail, uh, we get uh, single qubit gates that are in the 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 range, and they're only 50 to 100 nanoseconds in duration. So they're really quite competitive uh, right away, even with the transmon, but they have this error detection capability now built in. Right. If we zoom out for a second from the head slaps and the cats and, and the transmons, tell me a little bit about the company. How large are you? How are you funded? Um, what should, where are you physically based? What can yeah. you share? Well, I'll start with where we're physically based. We're sitting right uh, next, right, really right next to campus at Yale in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, this is ground zero for quantum circuits. And it's, uh, we think it's ground zero for what uh, the state of Connecticut calls the uh, quantum corridor, which they're working very hard to develop. So we're very excited to be part of that uh, physically in, in New Haven and uh, next to Yale. Um, the company's about uh, 70 people large. Uh, obviously, a very large percentage of them are PhDs, many of which have graduated right out of 
Rob's program. And um, it's a group of very young, bright scientists working on what they believe is the ultimate best solution in quantum computing. Um, our investors aren't too bad either, by the way. If you take a look at our investment uh, group, we have some of the biggest names in, in the community investing in us. They believe in us long term. Uh, Sequoia Capital, Canaan, Arch Ventures, uh, F Prime, and others. Uh, we recently added Incutel uh, to our group of investors, and uh, and we feel pretty proud about that since we're in many cases their only investment in quantum computing. Um, so uh, one of the things I think is very unique about this business, as we've been working towards working quantum computing solutions, is we burn the least amount of capital compared to others who've reached similar milestones. And uh, I think that's a pretty interesting and notable approach. And it kind of backs up what Rob is saying is it's a simpler approach to solving a bigger problem. And we're hoping we can carry that forward. So, you know, a little bit about our business is, you know, this is a stepping stone approach. Um, we're taking something to the market. Uh, we think we have something good. We validated it. We've talked to other scientists to prove it. Uh, now it's time to actually get validation by real users, uh, letting real customers try it, uh, modifying the algorithms that they may have written to work on other quantum solutions, uh, adding our novel features, which are capable of doing new things in quantum computing that they couldn't have done before, and just you know moving the needle in terms of their ability to discover something that they need to discover within their specific domains, whether it be in pharma or petrochemical or networking or in financial services or whatever the case may be. And we're going to get that validation and show it to the public. So um, so that's kind of the journey that we're on. Um, we've been sciencing the heck out of this for years. Uh, we're in the process of feeling very good about where we're at and beginning the engineering process. And we believe we have something that can actually scale. Um, one Kind of Can I interject one yeah. thing there? I mean, sure. you know, sort of one thing that's maybe different about our model, I still have a dual role. I'm primarily at the university, but I'm a consultant here at Quantum Circuits, Inc. Um, you know, the idea is that we're still doing fundamental discovery work uh, in the right kind of environment to do that, which is, uh, you know, graduate students uh, kind of open-ended questions doing high risk, high, high reward uh, explorations of novel things. But at the same time, what's different here at Quantum Circuits, you know, there's a cadre of the quantum physics uh, circuit QED experts, but we also have added, right, the software engineers, the mechanical engineers, the RF electrical engineers, the firmware engineers that it takes to build a full platform. And so one way we've been able, I think, to be capital efficient is kind of, you know, we're not burning investors' capital, uh, you know, creating uh, everything from uh, the start. It's really we get to focus on the engineering and the scaling of things while the science is done on campus. When could someone access this machine? It's a very good question. Uh, we already have commercial customers that are engaged with the company, um, beginning to work through our full stack solution. So we have a, a cloud portal and we have a solution where the uh, software can be developed using these new novel features, uh, leveraging the error correction capability that Rob talked about and uh, error detection capability that is built into the qubit from the start. And we're moving that through the simulation environment to prepare the software for actual cu customer uh, use on cold hardware running in the lab. So uh, so that's happening imminently. So you're actually talking to us at a very important tipping point in the development of this company is that we're going from lab to commercial implementation uh, literally as we speak. So it's happening as right now. You mentioned cold. Does one need a dilution fridge to operate? This or like like all of these uh, superconducting technologies, we operate the quantum part at 10 millikelvin, and it's all controlled by uh, you know uh, RF um, high speed electronics that sits at at room temperature. Um, you know, I think there's still a long way you can go with uh, that basic approach. You know, we've seen people kind of brute forcing things up to uh, hundreds, and now even 
thousands of trans bond qubits. And, uh, you know, I think there's again, more elegant and, uh, simpler ways of doing some of these things that, uh, make the engineering challenges around operating a large scale system a lot easier, but the, the cryogenics is not really the hard part. That's another thing that's changed a lot since I started back in 1998, you know, now they're sort of not only commercially available, but they're kind of, you know, push a button that says cool down <laughs> and, uh, provided everything is good in the vacuum system. Uh, you're just, uh, off and running a day or so later. Um, so, uh, you know, we feel like this is, uh, you know, not really a bottleneck. No. And, you know, we think, um, you know, the future of what this industry will look like, of course, we'll build hardware quantum computing systems that are in cryogenic fridges and ship them and sell them to, to customers who want them physically in their location. But the real market opportunity is going to come from uh, providing those solutions through the cloud. So it doesn't matter that they're sitting cold uh, in a fridge. Um, the power of those systems will be available to anybody who wants to have access to them through cloud-based solutions. So, uh, so I often get a question about, you know, well, who's going to win? Uh, this is a race, and it's like the new space race. Who's going to get there first? And it's, uh, it's a compelling uh, conversation to have, especially over a cocktail or a beer with a few scientists and business people in the room. Uh, my point of view on this one is that uh, this is a race where there's going to be multiple winners. There's going to be a lot of potential for this market to generate a tremendous amount of value across multiple domains, not just quantum computing, but all the domains that will use it. And, um, and there are going to be multiple solutions available to that marketplace to solve a lot of problems. Um, I think uh, a company like Quantum Circuits with its full stack approach, its novel uh, dual rail cavity a qubit approach uh, with its correct first then scale approach, I think has an opportunity to be one of the winners. And, um, you know, we feel like we're on our way to make that happen. You mentioned earlier, modify their, the customers would modify their programs to use their, your machine. And now you mentioned full stack. So help me understand that. Do, do I just give as a customer, would I just give you a chasm program and Hey, run it on on the dual rail machine, or do I have to do something different to take advantage of the hardware? Right. So, uh, I mean, we've demonstrated sort of the canonical universal gate set on these, uh, dual rail qubits with, uh, all the single and two qubit gates. And it's perfectly possible to, uh, and we've done it to take a Kiskit or chasm program and, you know, push it through the full stack and, and run the, the thing that's different, of course, when you start thinking about error correction is you don't want to just uh, compile a program, play a pulse sequence, and measure what comes back at the end. What you need to be doing, of course, is watching for the errors as they occur and then taking some corrective action uh, and you know responding in real time to uh, you know the detection of an error in the quantum system. And so you know one thing that's I think unique about our, uh, control system and our software stack is that it's, you know, got built in this ability to do, uh, you know, real time detection and then to branch and change what happens next, depending on an error. And so, you know, this is what I mean when I say post NISC, you know, uh, that's not something that you're typically able to do on, uh, uh, an ordinary machine. So, you know, one example of this could be you're running an algorithm, part of the computation has been detected to have an error, but you're able to say, well, let's measure some observables that uh, aren't in the region where the error could have propagated, uh, and we get something out of that shot, uh, even though it's containing a certain error. The other thing that's, you know, uh, maybe the simplest is just recording the errors and then, you know, giving back to people, okay, we ran it a million times, this many times it had three errors, this many times it had two errors, here are the ones with one error, and this is the location in which the errors occurred. And, you know, here are the shots that to first order don't have any errors and give you a much higher uh, fidelity. So, you know, one of the things we've done just as a demonstration of this uh, potential with two qubits is running the uh, usual uh, variational quantum eigensolver routine 
uh, on a two qubit uh, H2 uh, model. And you know what we're able to do with just detecting these errors is get something which is such a high fidelity computation end to end from state preparation and gates and measurement that you reach chemical accuracy without any error mitigation or other kinds of things like that. So, you know, I think there's a hunger in the market right now for machines that have new and experimental features that have some differentiated capabilities. And uh, so we think there's a lot of interest. And indeed, as we've been talking to people, you know, they kind of perk up when they hear that it's not just the same as running on one of the other machines that's out there already. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to that. Since uh, Rob's not always in the room when we talk to these uh, potential commercial customers, we're calling them alpha customers today, but um, it's really enjoyable to watch data scientists who've been working in this space for quite some time and you put on the table something they've never seen before. Um, the ability to do the real-time uh, control flow and change the way the algorithm works based on the real-time feedback of the error is, uh, is something new and novel and it's uh, it's expanding their potential, and it's uh, really enjoyable to watch the eyebrows go up when we put that on the table. So let me play back what I heard and ask the next question here. So uh, superconducting qubits, new types of superconducting, uh, cryogenic cooling required, uh, inherently lower error rate. I would guess that connectivity would be similar to what you see in other superconducting systems. And so... It, it sounds like you would need fewer qubits to get meaningful results, but still at some point people want thousands or, or tens of thousands of qubits. How does this scale? Other, uh, whether trapped ions or superconducting manufacturers say, well, we're going to have optical interconnects, or every time we get more than a few hundred qubits, we're going to have multiple networked machine. Does that also apply to your approach? Yeah, I think the, the superconducting approach, and in particular our implementation of it, uh, does really well with this kind of modular architecture. So we've already done, uh, you know, uh, and published uh, science experiments where you basically have uh, some of these qubits in separate modules, and you just need a, a simple microwave cable uh, uh, or or flex connect, which um, links the two modules. And um, you know, a really interesting thing I think with uh, superconducting devices, you, you can kind of convert from a standing qubit, including one of our dual rails, to a flying qubit in like the same time that it takes to do uh, uh, a single gate. And, um, you know, the main problem you get when you have these kind of modular connections is typically the uh, quality factor of the wiring is not as good as what's inside the processor. And what that means is you just have a little bit more uh, photon loss on those links, which again is something that you know we can apply all these error detection and error correction uh, techniques to. So, um, you know, I think uh, there's a pretty straightforward path in terms of scaling the the quantum hardware. I think you know an interesting question is how big is the block going to be that you incorporate? And my answer to that is always, well, it's the biggest quantum computer you can reliably build. <laughs> And then you make two of them and you connect them together. But, you know, uh, kind of more practically, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's straightforward to get uh, several hundred in a single block and then, you know, be uh, connecting those together. And so, you know, I think compared to ions, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot nicer because we don't have to invent the high efficiency uh, ion to uh, ultraviolet photon uh, link and, you know, all those sorts of things. So, um, you know, I think the superconducting systems are in the lead. Uh, another interesting thing that's a bit different about our technology is it's modular, like, already. So um, we don't make a single monolithic chip. We make these uh, three-dimensional modules, and they contain multiple uh, chips that have the Josephson Junction devices for the input and output and control. And what is nice about that is if you, you know, cool the system down and one or two of your devices are not quite in spec where you wanted them to be, you just can change out those individual devices uh, and you can kind of rapidly converge to something uh, in a way which is, again, less capital intensive, 
than uh, building a foundry and cranking out uh, hundreds of chips till you get the one that works. As we get closer to the end of our conversation today, I'm curious if this dual rail film didn't work or maybe you determined in a few years that it doesn't work, what's your next best favorite quantum modality? <laughs> uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's hard to foresee the future. <laughs> um, you know, I, when we started, I didn't actually imagine that we would get to, uh, a, a budding industry within my professional lifetime. Right. And we definitely didn't expect, uh, many of the innovations or breakthroughs that have happened along the way, you know, uh, one of the things that happened around 2010 was like discovering this three-dimensional approach and solving some of the materials problems and having coherence times of transmons leap by two orders of magnitude. Uh, that was something we did in our, in our labs at Yale. Um, uh, you know, I think we're working on various kinds of innovations that can offer the same kind of transformational breakthroughs, uh, and it can be applied to this basic architecture. So, um, you know, there's certainly room to make better cavities, better kinds of gates, you know, we're working on, uh, it's kind of fun cause this is a, a fairly new approach and, you know, we're doing things like inventing, you know, six different ways of doing a two qubit gate all in the last, uh, half a year or something. So, um, you, you know, I think, uh, the path weaves and is a little hard to predict sometimes, but, um, uh, you know, when you're doing it right, you don't have to, uh, throw everything out and start again. What you can do is you can layer the innovations on top of what you already have. So that was a very elegant non-answer, right? Because you're basically saying it's going to work. Don't worry about it. But, it, but if it didn't, I don't care. You know, I, I, I was going to say that's uh, one of the best stump the scientist questions I've heard in a long time. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, I don't want to talk about the specific things that I think could be huge jumps until we actually show that they're real. Uh, um, but uh, I do think that this dual rail is like the simplification, uh, but differentiating factor that's really uh, going to enable us to uh, you know, solve the problem of error correction. That's the yeah. really important thing that we're, we're focused on. From a less, from a less scientific point of view, my observation is, you know, this industry has been living on levels of enlightenment <clears throat> and the dual rail is another level of enlightenment. It's a, it's a new approach solving a problem that's very complicated and has been perplexing other companies for years, uh, to get to. And uh, I think we're going to contribute to the industry in a pretty interesting way as more and more people become aware of what we can do. Um, and at the same time, we're going to learn a little bit more about how we can improve what we've got. So, so I, I don't think there is a short window here of opportunity on dual rail. I think this one's here to last for a long, long time. And, um, you know, we'll take a look and see what develops outside and see if it can apply to what we're doing. And we'll all reach a new level of enlightenment together. Mm -hmm. So my last question is a hypothetical, if I may, um, maybe Ray first and then Rob, if you could have dinner with one of the quantum greats dead or alive, who would that person be? Well, I mean, for me, it's going to be Einstein, but I've got the next <laughs> Einstein here sitting with me on this call. So I am thrilled every day to be a partner of Rob, um, to, to sit around and watch his vision come to reality. And we've had many dinners that I would consider to be quite fascinating already. And I'm looking more, more forward to that as well. But I'm curious to hear what Rob's answer is to this question. Yeah, I think the first one that uh, leaps to mind for me is Norman Ramsey. So, uh, you know, everybody does a Ramsey experiment and talks about their Ramsey times uh, all day, every day. He was one of the real innovators of both NMR and uh, atomic physics. And I, sadly, I never got to meet him. The other one I really would like to meet uh, uh, now that I think of it is Ed Purcell. Uh, so we all know the Purcell effect. Um, and, uh, you know, he was both one of the drivers of uh, microwave technology at the Rad Lab during World War II. And then uh, also all these kinds of innovations that came after. So 
those two would be nice to sit down and have dinner with. I think they'd be a where we are. <laughs> Ray, Rob, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks a lot, Yuval. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks very much.